So guys, good morning and today's session, we will be talking about consolidated financial statements where we look at multiple standards. So India's 110 is the main standard which deals with consolidation. But apart from India's 110, we have standards like India's 27, 28, 111 and 112, which also have to be understood along with consolidation. So when I talk about consolidation, it is consolidation with a subsidiary, associate and a joint venture. All these three combined are called as group companies. They are called as group companies. So all these three group companies put together, what we discuss as one single chapter is called as consolidated financial financial statements. So my intention with this video is to basically bring you the concepts of consolidation all at one place. There is a basic nature of consolidation, steps involved in consolidation, exemptions from consolidation, adjustments to consolidation. So all these things I am trying to bring it up in one place and I am trying to discuss as a part of this chapter. Now, I will definitely be solving approximately about 20 to 21 questions as far as chap this chapter is concerned and majority of them are the newly added problems as far as your ICI new study material or the revised study material is concerned. But are these problems sufficient? Absolutely no. Guys, when we talk about consolidation comprehensive problems, where we'll be at least solving two problems on comprehensive nature, you need to understand about the time taken in solving those problems. Generally, the time taken, if you're solving it for the very first time, just understanding the concept, it could take something around one hour for you to complete the problem. But understand that one hour which you are taking to complete solving the problem will come down to at least 30 to 35 minutes if there is a repeated practice of multiple questions. Now, unfortunately, your study material has a very limited comprehensive question. So you can always bank on your model test papers or revision test papers to find more comprehensive problems. There's one such problem which also appeared as a compulsory question in your Jan 2021 exam. So remember guys, all those people who are of an intention that I can leave this chapter as choice. Last exam or your January 2021 exam, this question was a compulsory question. So therefore, all those people having an intention that I will take this cha the, the, a choice of this chapter, then it may not be possible in all situations. Yes, majority of the time you can take a choice, but here it is not possible. And one more thing why I discourage in taking a choice is consolidation is one such chapter where if you know the basic nature of consolidation, you can definitely score at least 60 to 70% of the marks allotted. So let's say I have a problem for 12 marks. I can definitely score about eight marks, even if I know the basic nature of consolidation. Now, I cannot give you any such assurance when you're writing other India's related standards. Because let's say I make a small error in reading the question or interpreting the answer of that question, then automatically the entire marks which are allotted will be zero. That is the reason why consolidation is a safer bet. It's a very safe bet because as far as consolidation is concerned, apply your common sense. There are two balance sheets which are given to us. I am combining these two balance sheets. In combining these two balance sheets, what are the adjustments necessary is all that you need to understand. Clear? So we will go by the step-by-step -step approach in understanding consolidation. I'll give you examples that will help you understand consolidation. Approximately, this could take about four, four and a half hours of entire concepts relating to our consolidation and also solving the problems around this chapter. Clear? Now let's get into the concepts of consolidation first. Now, first thing, how did consolidation actually come into your picture? Guys, earlier, if you look at even the IGAP, which had AS 21, 23, and 27, and here today we have comparative standards of India's 27, 28, 110, 111, and 112, you need to understand that none of these standards specify the application of the standard. None of these standards come up with applying the standard saying that these standards are applicable in these particular circumstances. He simply says, whenever an enterprise intends to present financial statements on a consolidated basis, then they need to apply these standards. That's all is what he said. So that means fundamentally the applicability of these standards is not governed by either IGAP or the index. 
So the applicability, if I was talking about prior to Companies Act 2013, where your IGAP was applicable, consolidation was only limited to SEBI listed enterprises, where as a part of listing agreement, you had to present a consolidated financial statement. Apart from those listed enterprises, we do not have consolidated financial statements applicable to any other sort of enterprise. But after the introduction of Companies Act 2013, we have observed that section 123, 3 and 4 sections have been in, incorporated into the Companies Act, which require any company which has one or more subsidiaries to present financial statements on consolidated basis. So what happened? By transitioning from Companies Act 1956 to Companies Act 2013, the scope of consolidation has increased multifold. Why multifold? 1956, no consolidation as per Companies Act. So until then, consolidation was only limited to those companies which had their securities listed in any stock exchange. But once we came into Companies Act 2013, now he has removed that concept. He has inserted consolidation as a part of Companies Act itself. Therefore, any company, whether listed or unlisted, if it has one or more subsidiary, needs to perform consolidation and needs to present financial statements on consolidated basis. That increases the scope. Because earlier private limited companies, unlisted public enterprises, they were not coming under consolidation. But after the insertion of 129.3 and 4, you have consolidation applicable to any company which has one or more subsidiary. Therefore, the scope of the standard has definitely increased multifold. India's 27 deals with separate set of financial statements. What do you mean by separate set of financial statements? That means a holding company which has one or more subsidiary is presenting financial statements only for the holding company without consolidation. That is called a separate set of financial statements. Number two, your investments in associates and joint ventures consolidation is prescribed as per a method called as equity method which is prescribed under India's 28. India's 110, where we talk about consolidated financial statements with a subsidiary, which is a direct comparable standard to AS21, prescribes something called as full consolidation method. Here, then comes joint arrangement, where we have joint controls and joint ventures. So joint controls and joint ventures have to be understood with respect to India's 111. 112 is a pure disclosure standard, there's nothing much that we have to discuss as a part of India's 112. So let's see what is the concepts of consolidation. I'm not going to name the standard. We're just going to go ahead with understanding what is consolidation with respect to multiple slides that we're going to come across. The first thing, understand. When do you call something as a subset? Where an enterprise um, controls the other enterprise, then you can say that there is a holding subsidiary relationship which has actually existed. Now, when do you say control? The word control, when I use, I need to understand that the definition of control is distinct from Companies Act and India's 110. What does India's 110 define control as? What does your Companies Act define control as? Earlier under IGAP, your value, the, your definition of control was the same for both Companies Act 1956 as well as AS21. But however, after the introduction of India's 110, the definition which was given under AS23 has changed. Therefore, the Companies Act comes out with a different control definition, while your India's 110 comes out with a complete different definition. Let's see what is the control definition then. According to your Companies Act 2013, Section 227, it says that an enterprise has a control over other enterprise, if I have a right to control over the management and policy decisions by virtue of shareholding, by virtue of shareholding, I have a control over the management decisions and the policy decisions taken by the company. So that means what? By virtue of shareholding, that means my voting power in that particular enterprise is more than 50%. So since I have majority shareholding, I might be in a position where I could influence or I could control, I could dictate what are the management decisions and policy decisions taken by the enterprise. First one. Second one, where I have a right to appoint the majority of the board of directors. 
Now, it may be through voting power or it may be through an arrangement with the management where I get a right to appoint majority of the board of directors. Then in such situation, the enterprise is set to control the other enterprise. So what are the two types of control which are given under Companies Act 227 section? Number one, where by virtue of the shareholding, an enterprise can either control the management decisions or can control the policy decisions taken by the management. That means the voting power of the enterprise is at least 50% in the other enterprise. Number two, where by virtue of either the voting power or by virtue of another arrangement with the company, I have a right to appoint majority of the board of directors. Then I could have a control being demonstrated as far as the subsidiary is concerned. So these are the two parts which we also discuss under your AS21 as well. AS21 definition of control is also limited to only these two points. But India S110 has looked beyond this point. I'll tell you. Let's say for example, a company like Reliance Industries. You know where Reliance conducts its AGA? It's in Wonkade Stadium because that is the number of shareholders he has. The number of shareholders he has at any point of time, the only place where he can conduct the AGM in Mumbai, which is his registered address or registered place of business, is only Wonkade Stadium. That is the number of people. I don't know how many of you remember this movie Guru, where he'll be, uh, Abhishek Bachchan is standing and waving to the crowd and it's a Wankade Stadium which is being covered. That is the size of AGM which is being conducted. That is the size of shareholding that it has. But let's say for suppose, a, com a management or a particular individual or another company controls only 35% of the total shares in Reliance. By virtue of voting power, it is not more than 50%, but I am saying only 35% is the voting power that he can do. On a general tendency, when I observed the total shareholding of the people who are attending my AGM, it was only 60%. Only 60% of the voting power or 60% of the shares held, those shareholders are making it to the Wonkade Stadium. Because my other shareholders might be in different parts of the country, may not be making it to the AGM and my AGM is also limited to a size of Wonkade Stadium. I cannot fill more than that. Therefore, in such kind of situations where I am talking about, if only 60% of voting power is present at any AGM on my based on my past experience, if I hold 35%, that is sufficient enough to override the balance shareholders. The balance shareholders are less than 1% shareholders. So those people, I can definitely override my decisions because I myself hold 35% of the shareholding. Therefore, it is not necessary for someone to hold more than 50% of voting power to have a control over the uh, uh, over the investee or over the subsidiary. Clear? That is the first point which I wanted to drive. That's why the control definition required a change. The control definition required a change. I have 25% shareholding. Can I control? I can definitely control if the remaining 75% shareholding is in the hands of multiple shareholders and each one is not even holding 1% share capital. There can be demonstration of control even in such situations where I hold only 25% of voting power. Therefore, it is not necessary for someone to hold at least 50% of voting power to exercise control because you need to understand that the remaining voting power is divided into small, 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 small bits and pieces. So that's why India's 110 demonstrates control in a different sense. He says three conditions are necessary to be satisfied to demonstrate control. First one, X Limited has a power over, sorry, the holding company has a power over the investee. What do you mean by power over the investee? A power to influence the uh, decisions made by the investee, a power to in control the investee, a power to direct the investee to perform certain functions. That is first one called as a power over the investee. Now, it is exposed to variable returns. What do you mean by variable returns over the investee? I am exposed to variable returns means I am deriving returns in the form of dividends. Dividends are variable. 10% debenture. The rate of return which I expect from the, per, from the person who is holding this debenture 
is basically to get 10% as a return. It's a fixed return. There's no variable return out there. But if I hold equity shares, I might get dividend at the rate of 20% in one year. I might get dividend at the rate of 60% in one year. I might not get dividend in one particular year as well. So therefore, one has to understand that whenever there is a control, that person who is actually exercising the control or the investor is exposed to variable returns from the investee. Number three, the investee or the parent enterprise has a ability to use its power to influence or to affect the returns from the investee. I have a power to influence the returns or to affect the returns from which are expected to be received from the investee. That means if the decision making regarding activities, decision making regarding payment of dividend, if I can direct, if I have an ability to basically have a control over such kind of power, then I can say that it is a subsidiary. All three conditions are necessary to be satisfied. Number one, there is a power over the investing. They are exposed to variable returns and they have an ability to use the power to influence or affect the returns of the in, uh, returns which are expected from the investing. Clear? So this is fundamentally what is control. But if you look at Companies Act 2013, is giving you two types of control where I have, by virtue of voting power, a control over management decisions or I have a right to appoint majority of the board of directors. Both are separated by or. In this 110 definition, control is separated by and. That means all three conditions are necessary to be satisfied. Here, any of the two conditions are necessary to be satisfied. If I go as per Companies Act, each subsidiary can have, I'm not saying will have, I'm saying can have two holding companies. One by virtue of shareholding, one by virtue of their agreement to, or arrangement to appoint the majority of board of directors. So that is the reason why we say that control as such has taken a significant change under India's 110. Because according to India's 110, where all three conditions are necessary to be satisfied, there can only be one holding company for a subsidiary. You cannot have multiple holding companies. Clear? So what is control under 110? Control is established when the investor has have power over the investee. He is, he is exposed to variable returns from the investee. Number three, he has an ability to use the power over the investee to influence or to affect the investor returns. If these three conditions together are satisfied, then the investor has a control over the investee. That is where the holding subsidiary relationship exists. Clear? Now, question very smartly will be asked, which one should I comply with? I'll have to comply with both the definitions. If I comply with one definition that is not sufficient, I should be in a position to comply with both the definition. Both together have to be assessed in, in, a, in directing whether there's a control or not. What is the exemption from consolidation? Guys, if you look at your accounting standard AS21, he has provided a, a particular exemption saying that if the investments held in the subsidiary are of a nature that the in parent enterprise expects to sell these investments and realize a short term gain. That means at the time of acquiring the control itself, I had an intention to dispose of the investments or I have an intention to sell the investments at any near future point of time. Near future means less than 12 months. Then in such cases, consolidation is not necessary. Consolidation is not necessary in such situation. But when it comes to exemptions under India's 110, he gave a different view of exemption itself. Let's see what he's talking about. Let's say X controls Y. Y controls Z. X is called as the ultimate parent enterprise. Y is called as intermediary parent enterprise. And Z is anyways a subset. Now the exemption from consolidation is not given to X. It is given to Y, which is an intermediary parent. Question will be why? Because 
Then when consolidation occurs or consolidation is supposed to happen on the financial statements day, X is anyways consolidating with both Y and Z. So why should, why should Y enterprise again consolidate? That is the point that he is trying to drive. So he is saying, Y is eligible to claim an exemption from consolidation. When can he claim exemption from consolidation? Number one. Y is also a subsidiary of another parent enterprise. Okay. Y is also a subsidiary of another parent enterprise. Number two, neither equity instrument nor debt instrument of Y Limited are listed or traded in public market. They are neither listed nor traded in public market. Number two, Y Limited is not in the process of filing any statements with the SEBI for the purpose of listing any class of finance, uh, class of instruments. That means I am not even in the process of listing. Why is not in the process of listing? I have not submitted any financial statements or any other necessary documents to SEBI or the securities board for listing of any class of my instruments be debt or equity. Finally, the ultimate parent has provided financial statements on consolidated basis. So when the final ultimate parent company is anyways consolidating, the intermediary subsidiary or intermediary parent enterprise is exempted from consolidation. But remember, to exercise this exemption, I also need to take the approval of the other shareholders in Y Limited. X holds 80% shares in Y. Let the other 20% is held by minority shareholders. Those minority shareholders also should be given an approval, also should give an approval to give an exemption for Y Limited to, uh, to exempt from consolidation. So what are the necessary conditions to be satisfied? I'm putting four conditions. Broadly, I'll classify it as three. Number one, the intermediary parent enterprise is also a subsidiary of the ultimate parent enterprise. So that means this parent enterprise is a subsidiary of another enterprise. In this case, Y was a subsidiary of X Limited. Number two, no class of its instruments, be it equity or debt, were listed in the stock market or traded in public markets. Along with that, I'll also give you one more point, even clubbed into the second one. The Y Limited, which is the parent, has not filed any necessary documentation with the Securities Board of India for listing any of its class of securities. So neither the securities are listed nor in the process of listing. That is second exception. Third one, the ultimate parent enterprise, in this case that is the X Limited, which is the ultimate parent, is providing financial statements on consolidated basis. In such cases, with the approval of all the shareholders of intermediary parent, Y Limited can claim exemption from consolidation. There are certain illustrations that we look into this. So be very careful. Your control definition, which we have just seen now, power over the, in the investor has a power over the investee, exposed to variable returns, has an ability to use its power over the investee to influence the investor returns. These are the three points and these are exemptions. So certain cases where the intermediary parent enterprise, in this case, the Y Limited is exempt from consolidation or is eligible to claim an exemption from consolidation. Both these points have been tested or a new illustrations have come in as far as your study material is concerned, which is going around the similar paragraphs what we have just discussed now. Clear? Now, what is your procedures of consolidation? Now, I will talk about steps of consolidation separately, but I am here only talking about the procedures which are involved in consolidation. In logical sense, I am giving you two balance sheets and both these balance sheets have to be combined. In combining these balance sheets, what are you supposed to do? I can combine assets. I can combine liabilities. I can combine incomes. I can combine cash flows. I can combine expenses. I can combine my assets, liabilities, incomes, expenses, cash flows. But while you are combining these, the intergroup transactions should be eliminated. Intergroup transactions means if the subsidiary is showing the holding company as a debtor, the holding company is showing the subsidiary as a creditor, 
then these two are supposed to be cancelled. They have to be eliminated. A bill has been given to the subsidiary by the holding company. Holding company shows it as bills payable. Subsidiary company shows it as bills received. When I combine assets and liabilities, these holding and subsidiaries, sorry, these bills receivable and bills payable are supposed to be eliminated. One more thing which is compulsory to eliminate is the investments held by the holding company in the subsidiary. Because without investment, you cannot have holding subsidiary relationship. Therefore, the holding company in its balance sheet has been writing the investments in subsidiary on the asset side. This investment in subsidiary should not be represented after consolidation. How do I eliminate it? We'll discuss it. Relax for now. New situations arise. At the time of eliminating this investment in subsidiary, it gives rise to something called as goodwill or bargain purchase as per India's 103. 103 is about business combination. So why is it 103 coming into picture? We'll talk about. But I'm saying, when I eliminate this investment in subsidiary, which we just discussed, it gives rise to a, another event or another item in the consolidated balance sheet called as goodwill or bargain purchase. Another item which arises during consolidation is called as non-controlling interest. So these two happen to be the new things that we have to discover and how to calculate as a part of consolidation. Because combining is what? Simple addition. Elimination means after you, at the time you add, you might deduct this. But new two situations are coming up. Non-controlling interest and goodwill or bargain purchase arising at the time of eliminating your investment in group companies. These two situations have to be discussed on how to be computing, how do we compute these. Here, what is non-controlling interest? Non-controlling interest or minority interest, it is nothing but to the extent, let's say X holds in Y 70% hold. If X holds in Y 70% holding, then X is a parent enterprise, Y is a subsidiary compulsory because there is a control by virtue of voting power. But if 70% is held by X in Y, the balance 30% shares in Y are held by someone else. Who are these someone else? There could be multiple shareholders or there could be only one single shareholder. But this person, who holds only 30% is not in a position to control Y limited. If X has a control over Y limited, the other shareholders holding 30% shares cannot exercise control over Y limited. Therefore, X is called as a controlling party and these people are called as minorities. They are called as minorities. These minority shareholders should be represented in the consolidated balance sheet with a name called as non-controlling interest. If X has controlling interest, then these minority interests have an interest in Y limited, but they are called as non-controlling in nature. So I call them as NCI, non-controlling interest. This word non-controlling interest has occurred new in India's 110. Earlier under AS21, these non-controlling interests were called as minority interest. Clear? They were earlier called as minority interest. So what is NCI? NCI represents other than parent enterprise share in the equity of the subsidiary. Other than parent entity share in the equity of the subsidiary. Now what do you mean by equity? Equity means share capital along with reserves. So in this example if I talk about, I will simply say that the minority interest or NCI, non-controlling interest is equal to 30% of share capital plus reserves of the subsidy. Clear? Or you can also say equity as assets minus outside liabilities. So in such situation, I can say NCI is equal to 30% of the total net assets in Y limited. This way also you can represent. So whatever it is, whatever way you represent, it depends on question to question. I can simply say, NCI represents other than holding companies or other than parent enterprises share in the equity of the subsidiary. So equity means share capital plus reserves or assets minus outside liabilities called as net assets. Whatever is your equity, if I calculate what is the minority share of those equity, 
that should be considered as NCI, which should arise at the time of consolidated financial statements. It should arise at the time of consolidated financial statements. Clear? Your NCI, which is non-controlling interest, can be measured in two ways. One is called as fair value method. Other one is called as proportionate share method. What is fair value method? Fair value method is nothing but fair value of the subsidiary multiplied by minority holding. I calculate what is the total fair value of the subsidiary or what is the fair value per share in the subsidiary and I will multiply it with the minority share holding. If you calculate the total fair value of the subsidiary, then I will multiply it with minority share holding as a percentage. If I calculate fair value per share in the subsidiary, then I will multiply it with number of shares held by minority shareholders. In that way, I can get non-controlling interest under fair value method. Then what is proportionate share method? This is a common procedure that we follow and this was the procedure which was earlier laid down even under AS21. AS21 did not have fair value method. It is India's 110 which introduced the fair value method to us but otherwise NCI or minority interest was earlier calculated under proportionate share method. What is proportionate share method? Calculate the total net assets of the subsidiary. Net assets you can calculate by assets minus outside liabilities or share capital plus reserves. Whatever it is, that is the equity of the subsidiary multiplied by minority shareholding. That will give you NCI or minority interest by proportionate share method. Clear? Now, where should NCI be represented in consolidated financial statements? NCI should be represented along with the liabilities and equity. And where under liabilities and equity? Within equity itself, but should be separate from share capital and other equity. Therefore, in generally, whenever I talk about shareholder funds, I generally have only two line items, share capital, other equity. But upon consolidation, I get three line items, share capital, other equity, non-controlling interest. Clear? Now, preference share holding, preference share capital which of the subsidiary, to an extent, it is not held by the holding company. Preference share capital, to the extent, it is not held by the holding company should be included in the computation of NCI. Let me see. Let me see what this is. Let's say there are two enterprises X and Y. X is the parent enterprise. Y obviously is my subsidiary. X holds, let's say, 80% of voting power in subsidiary. That means the balance 20% voting power in the subsidiary is held by someone called as minority. minority or non-controlling interest guys like i told you voting power is derived from equity shares but what if what if in y limited there are some preference share capital let's say my preference share capital in y limited is equal to 100. Is it necessary that the holding company should hold even the preference shares as well? Not necessary. Therefore, what happened was this preference share capital was held by X to a certain extent and the balance to a certain extent. Let's say X only is holding 20 rupees of preference share capital, only 20. Therefore, the balance is 80. Correct? To the extent of 20, 
I will consider in computation of cost of control. What is this cost of control? I'll tell you later. We haven't come to that concept of cost of control yet. But cost of control is computed as per index 103. It is computed as per index 103. This balance 80, which is not held by the holding company, this one should be added to NCI. This should be added to non-controlling interest. This is exactly what we are talking about. So what did I say? I said preference share capital to an extent it is not held by the holding company should be included or should be added to your computation of non-controlling interest. That is what my second line says. Preference share capital in the subsidiary to the extent not held by the parent enterprise should be included in the computation of non-controlling interest. Clear? Now, can NCI be a negative figure? Again, a very good question I'm asking. Can NCI be a negative amount? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. NCI is what? NCI is equal to minority holding as a percentage multiplied by the net tax or equity of subsidiary. Net assets or equity of subsidiary. Right. Can NCA be negative? Yes, it can be negative. Why, why does it become negative? If your net assets in the subsidiary are negative, then even your NCI can be negative. Absolutely right. Then question comes up, why is the net assets of subsidiary negative? That means the losses accumulated in the subsidiary are greater than the share capital in the subsidiary. Losses accumulated in the subsidiary are greater than the share capital of the subsidiary, then you do come across a situation where NCI is a negative figure. NCI positive, liability side under shareholder funds I represent. NCI negative, should I represent it on the asset side? No. It should still be continued to be reported as a negative amount as far as your share capital is concerned. Sorry, as far as your shareholding funds is concerned. Clear? So what am I saying? NCI can definitely be a negative amount and such negative amount should be presented <coughs> in the in, in under shareholder funds itself. So NCI may represent negative figure if subsidiary incurs losses which are accumulated in such a way that they exceed the paid up share capital of the company. And with that, we come to the end of discussion on NCI though I did not completely come across the computation of NCI. But let's move into this concept of cost of control. What is this cost of control and why does this arise? Let me help you with an example. Let's say I have an enterprise X. I have an enterprise Y. X has acquired 70% of voting power in Y. This 70% was acquired on, let's say it is on 28th of March 2021. 28th March 2021, X has acquired 70% of voting power in Y. The date on which an entity acquires a control over the other entity, on that date, this transaction is called as business combination. So on this day, I will call this as business combination. Business combination arises when an enterprise has acquired controlling interest over the other enterprise. And business combination has to be dealt as per India. So what am I saying? On the day on which X exercises the control or X acquires control over Y. On that day, 
you will have to apply India's 103 business combination. According to the standard of India's 103, on the date of acquisition, with respect to date of acquisition, I have to calculate something called as cost of control. What is cost of control? Cost of control which is identified with respect to date of acquisition by applying in days 103 is to identify that is to determine the termination of goodwill or bargain purchase. How do you calculate this goodwill or bar bargain purchase? That is your cost of control. Let's see. For control, cost of control in determination of goodwill or bargain purchase, it should be computed with respect to the date of acquisition of control in subsidiary. On that date of acquisition, I'll apply in days 103, right? So let's say for suppose, this was Y Limited's financials on 28th of March. Okay. Let's say for example, my total assets are 200 on the date my share capital or equity share capital was about 50 my reserves and surplus was about 80 and my other liabilities for the balancing oh no i don't think so it is 70 yeah it is 70 so this is how i conclude on this day, X Limited acquired interest in Y Limited. X cost of acquisition cost of acquisition of 70% in Y is let's say about 150. Then my cost of acquisition of interest in Y Limited is 150. Now, by paying 150 rupees, what did I acquire? By paying 150, X acquired 70% of equity of Y. 70% of net assets of Y. So calculate your net assets of Y. Net assets of Y on 28. Liabilities or add share capital and reserves. Answer is 130. Answer is 130 on that date. But how much did X acquire? 70 percent. So what is X share? X share in net assets of Y. Net assets of Y. 70% calculate of this. 70% is how much? 91. 91 is the net assets acquired by X. Right? X has acquired 91 rupees of net assets in Y. What is the cost of acquisition? The cost of this acquisition of 70% in Y was 150. Therefore, to buy 91 rupees of an asset, 91 rupees of net assets you acquired, but you paid 150. Therefore, the difference should be determined as goodwill. Since my cost of acquisition is greater, then I will determine a goodwill of 59 rupees. The difference should be considered as goodwill. And this is called as cost of control. So, what is cost of control? Cost of control is determined on the day on which the parent enterprise acquires controlling interest in the subsidiary. On that day, 
I will compare two things cost of acquisition compared with the holding companies or parent enterprises share in the net assets of the subsidiary. Comparing these two, I determine either goodwill or sometimes if my net assets are greater than cost of acquisition, then I'll call it as bargain purchase. Clear? This is acquired with respect to the date of acquisition. So that is the date on which India's 103 shall apply. Clear? Now, however, while computing the same 59, let me have a different idea also. I will calculate in a different way. I'll still have to get down to that 59 number only. Let's say I write it like this cost of acquisition by x in y, x acquired in y, 70% at what cost? At a cost of 150. This is 70%. What is the other 30%? The other 30% is the net assets which belong to minority interest or non-controlling interest. On 28th of March. How do you calculate NCI on that date? Calculate 30% multiplied by total net assets are. How much was the total net assets? 130. So what is your answer? NCI on that date total is only 39. 70 plus 30 that is total 100 percent. Total value of 100 percent is 189. I will compare this 189 with the total net assets in the subsidiary compared with net assets in March 2021, entire 100% net assets should be compared with entire 100% share capital. What is your net of net assets? The 100% of net assets is 130. Compare to answer again back to the same answer 59. The same answer that we ascertained above 59 was goodwill there, even 59 is goodwill here. But your in days 103 has prescribed this type of measurement and not this measurement. So this is not an appropriate measurement. You cannot calculate in this manner. Your computation should go like this. Cost of acquisition plus NCI should be compared with the net assets in the subsidiary on the date of acquisition. Guys, when you're calculating only on the date of acquisition, it is not going to change subsequently. Let's say the acquisition of control happened on 28 March 2021. When I am consolidating in 2022, when I consolidate in 2023, when I consolidate even in 2100 also, my amount of goodwill will still stay 59 because I am only calculating with respect to my date of acquisition. Your date of acquisition never changes. Therefore, even your goodwill or bargain purchase never changes. Never changes. Here. Guys, if you remember, NCA can be calculated in two methods. This is one method which is called as proportionate share method. This is called as proportionate share method. But there was also one more method that we have just seen. We said in days 110 gives you a choice to either go as per proportionate share method, which was there even under in days 21. Or you can even measure it under fair value method. So let's say NCA had to be measured at fair value and not at proportionate share. Then what do you do? I'll have to calculate NCA at fair value. Calculate. Cost of acquisition by X in Y. On 28th of March 2021, what is his cost? 150. Correct. I am measuring NCI at fair value on 
on the same date of acquisition 28 March 20. So instead of taking proportionate share, I am measuring it at fair value. How do I identify fair value? Very simple. This is for 70%. So what is 30%? Calculate into 3 by 7. I think you will get some random number. 150 because it's not divisible, divisible by 7. 150 divided by 7 into 3. 64.28 or 29 I think 64.29 in such case this is 214.29 if I compare this with net s x in y on the date of acquisition 28th of March 2000 what was the net s x on the date Net asset was 130. So this time I came across a goodwill which is 84.29. Observe earlier when I represented goodwill in the previous method, I calculated goodwill as only 59. But now, when I measure NCI at fair value, automatically my goodwill jumped to 84.29. Yes or no? Here the goodwill was 59. Correct? The goodwill of 59 rupees, if the NCI is measured under proportionate share method, but if you are calculating goodwill as per fair value method, it is 84.29. I'll tell you what. Here when I got NCI uh, goodwill as 59, as against 84.29 this 59 is considered to be goodwill which pertains only to goodwill in y only to x but this 84 this goodwill in y or NCI. Therefore, this is called as full goodwill. This is called as parent goodwill or proportionate share of parent goodwill. You know what? I can calculate it even without all that. If I know that the proportionate goodwill is 59 rupees which belongs to the parent, is only holding 70%. What is the full goodwill? 59 into 100 by 70. You should get the same answer. You will get the same answer 84.2. This is exactly right. So 59 is only the parent's portion of goodwill, while the total goodwill, full goodwill, which pertains to both X as well as non controlling interest, is 84.29. So this is exactly what we are discussing as far as the cost of control is concerned and I say I calculate cost of control with respect to the standard India's 103. When do you calculate? On the day on which the parent enterprise has acquired controlling interest in the subsidy. Only on that particular day I will calculate your cost of control. Clear? Look at the formulation. Cost of investment in subsidiary plus non-controlling interest on date of acquisition compared with the fair value of net assets and subsidiary on date of acquisition is resulting in either goodwill or bargain purchase. If A plus B that is cost of investment and your non-controlling interest was greater than fair value then it fair value of net assets it results in goodwill. Exact the other way around it results in bargain purchase. Clear? If NCI is measured at proportionate share method, goodwill arrived at in cost of control is parent portion of goodwill. This is what I told you towards the end. If NCI is measured at fair value, then the goodwill arrived at is called as full goodwill or fair value of goodwill. This is exactly what I was talking about. 
If you just remember, this is how I calculated the difference between 59 and 84 point whatever it is, right? 59 was only parents portion of goodwill. That 84 is basically full goodwill or the fair value of goodwill. Is Fakruddin for you? All those who want to take down, please take down. Just an example, guys. Random numbers, whatever I got in my head, that's why I, I get a points. If I would have actually planned the example, then there would not, wouldn't have been those points. So the question comes up, are we done with computation of cost of control? Answer is no. Because is it compulsory for a parent enterprise to acquire controlling interest in the subsidiary in one single transaction itself? No. 
Sometimes it can happen where the parent enterprise X Limited has acquired in Y Limited first about 40%, which was not controlling interest. In the subsequent transaction, he acquired another 20%. So the total controlling and uh, so total interest in the subsidiary, which was earlier 40 on acquisition of 20 has become 60, which is the date on which the controlling interest is acquired. So if I want to determine what is the cost of control, then my determination should be based on the second date when he acquired 20%. That is the date on which he has acquired controlling interest over the subsidy. First acquisition of 40% is not controlling interest. So the acquisition of controlling interest in the subsidiary should be computed. Your cost of control should be computed with respect to the second date when, is it, when he has acquired 20%. Clear? In such situation, how do I go about the computation? Very simple. Again, let's see some example out there. Again, a random example. Don't expect me to have round numbers out there. There was a company X and there's a company Y. X acquired interest in Y to the extent of 40% at 100 rupees on, let's say, give me a date, let's say 28th of March 2021. Controlling interest was not acquired on that date because it is only 40% interest. Subsequently, in Y, they have acquired another 20% of voting power by paying, let's say, 75 rupees on 15th of August 2021. So the total controlling interest has become 60%. But remember, what is your date of control? The date of control is this date on 20, sorry, 15th of August 2021. On this day, control in Y is acquired. Therefore, my cost of control computation should be based on 15th of August itself. Cost of control as per India's fund 103. Should be computed based on 15th of August 2021. On that day, I determine either a goodwill or bargain purchase. Let's see how do I calculate here. What is my cost of acquisition on that date? My cost of acquisition on 15th of August 2021, where I acquired how much? 20% share of voting is how much? I purchased it at a cost of, I've already given you, 75. Okay, part B. No NCI because another 40% was already acquired. That 40% which I acquired, I'll have to now measure it at fair value. Fair value of investments in Y already held by X. held by X and Y. How do I calculate the fair value of the investment? Guys, if 20% is 75, 40% is how much? 75 into 40 divided by 20. The proportion fair value is 40. But the total is only 60%. That means the balance 40% is held by NCI. Let's say, for example, in this case, I am saying that the net test 
inviry on 28th march is 130 like we have seen in the previous example on 15 august so what is your cost of control calculated based on 15th of august therefore when i calculate nci on 15th of august i can either take fair value or i can either calculate based on proportionate share method let's say i am taking proportionate share method i'll tell you how to calculate even fair value as well proportionate share method 200 is the net assets in by limited their shareholding nci shareholding is 40% It is forty percent because sixty percent is held by holding company. So forty percent NCI share on fifteen August is how much? Eighty. Calculate the total. Seventy-five plus fifty, two twenty-five. Two twenty-five plus eighty is three not five. I will compare this with. Part D, net assets. Limited on the entire net assets of on fifteenth August was two hundred. Therefore, this results in the resultant as goodwill. Guys, this is the pain of this not good. If I have to get full goodwill, then what do I do? I'll have to measure NCI at its fair value. Guys, if forty percent is one fifty, then forty percent uh, investment is one fifty. Then even this forty percent investment could also be one fifty. Correct. In that case, this total will not be three not five. It will be one fifty plus one fifty plus seventy five. This instead of three not five would become three seventy five. In such case, this goodwill will not be one hundred five, but instead it will be seventy five. So one hundred five is the parent share of goodwill, while one seventy five is the full goodwill of the entire enterprise or the fair value of goodwill. But remember, remember, my earlier investment of forty percent, I purchased it at what price? I purchased it at hundred. But today. On the day when you acquired controlling interest on fifteenth of August, I measured that investment as how how much? One fifty. So that means hundred rupees of investment in Y Limited has been restated to one fifty. Correct. My cost of investment by. On twenty eighth of March, two thousand twenty one, was hundred. This I have restated. Restated fair value. You restate the fair value on the date of acquiring controlling interest. Restated fair value of investment. On fifteenth August two thousand twenty-one, on that day I have restated it to a value of one fifty. Therefore, the value of your investment in Y Limited has increased. By This increase in the value of investment in Y Limited already held by X prior to acquisition of controlling interest should be transferred to. Fair value reserve transferred to fair value reserve. This fair value reserve should be transferred to get it under other equity. It should be presented as a part of other equity in my balance sheet. So what am I doing? I am recording an entry as cost of investment in Y Limited by fifty fifty uh, rupees increase. to fair value reserve 50 so automatically my cost of investment of 100 has now increased by 50 and became 150 on the date of 15th of august on that day i calculated my cost of control 
where I restated the previous investment to fair value and I identified proportionate goodwill as 105 or full goodwill as 175 depending on how you have measured your NCI. You can either measure NCI at carrying value at carrying value or sorry proportionate share method that is 80 or you could have measured it at fair value of 150 depending on which the value of your goodwill would have been 105 or 175 clear so this is the additional adjustment necessary whenever i have multiple dates of acquisition in subsidiary so what do i do whenever i have multiple investment dates then i'll have to first identify what is the date on which controlling interest was acquired once i've identified controlling interest then uh, once i have identified the date on which controlling interest was acquired then for calculating cost of control i will restate all the investments already held in subsidiary by the holding company will be restated to their fair value the difference between the cost and the difference between the fair value on the date of acquisition will be transferred to another reserve called as fair value reserve Let's look at this. Whenever I have multiple dates of acquisition, the cost of acquisition on the date of acquiring controlling interest plus the fair value of investment in, in subsidiary already held by parent enterprise plus NCI on date of acquisition of controlling in the subsidiary should be compared with the net assets of the subsidiary on date of acquisition to result in either goodwill or bargain purchase. Now the fair value of investment uh, in subsidiary already held by parent when compared with the cost of investment should be transferred to fair value reserve which is classified as a part of other equity this is my discussion on multiple dates of acquisition in a subsidiary by the parent enterprise
Since we have looked at already your computation of NCI and computation of cost of control in various situations, we have taken some examples to determine this. Now let's get into the concept of consolidation which has certain adjustments. Now what adjustments am I talking about? Now sometimes it happens to be a situation where you have two different dates of a subsidiary and balance sheet. A subsidiary's balance sheet and holding company's balance sheet. Let's say the balance sheet date of holding company is on 31st of March. Let's say the balance sheet of subsidiary is on 31st of December. In such case, can I consolidate? Is it necessary for me to redraft the subsidiary's balance sheet to meet the balance sheet date of holding company? That is the question. So let's try to understand this. Let's say for example, my parent enterprise X balance sheet date is 31st of March every year. My parent enterprise, my subsidiary Y has a balance sheet date of 31st December every year. Then can I consolidate? answer is yes as long as the difference between these two balance sheet dates difference is within if the difference between two balance sheet dates is within three months that is materiality he is talking about guys three months is purely materiality so over three months i don't expect the subsidiary to change so much that is the reason why he is saying you don't have to redraft the balance sheet of subsidiary Y uh, since the difference between two balance sheet days within three months. So you can directly consolidate with the subsidiary notwithstanding the difference in the reporting dates. But what if, what if I come across a similar situation but X has a balance sheet date of 31st March. Okay, but let's say Y, which is a subsidiary, is drafting its balance sheet date on 30th of September. Then in such cases, the difference between the two reporting dates is greater than three months. Since it is greater than three months, no consolidation is possible. Therefore, to facilitate consolidation, what you do is you will take this subsidiary and redraft I will redraft the balance sheet on 31st March to comply with the balance sheet date of holding company only if you have different reporting dates and the difference between the reporting dates is greater than three months. This is a new incorporation under India's 110. Remember guys, earlier under AS21, he said 6 months. It has been cut short to 3 months to make the balance sheet dates more relevant. More relevant. Guys, in practical sense, can I have a situation like this? Yes, but remember, most of the auditors will require the subsidiary to redraft the balance sheet date to confirm with the holding enterprise. So that is the most common situation which occurs. So we are talking about different reporting dates. Financial statements of holding and subsidiary are eligible to consolidate notwithstanding the difference in reporting dates if they are separated by not more than three months. However, if the difference is more than three months between the reporting dates, then the financial statements of the subsidiary should be redrafted on the reporting date of the parent enterprise to facilitate consolidation. Clear? So this is our concept regarding different reporting dates. Now let's talk about different accounting policies. Let's say the subsidiary and the holding have different accounting policies. Is it absolutely fine to have different accounting policies or is it necessary for the subsidiary to follow the same accounting policies as the parent enterprise? Answer is no. So that means a subsidiary can have a different set of accounting policies from the holding company's accounting policies. Let's say the holding company's accounting policy of evaluation of your inventory is as per weighted average cost basis. 
but the subsidiary is valuing its inventory on FIFO basis. Invent your assets in subsidiary are valued as per revaluation method. The assets as per your holding company is valued under cost approach. Different set of accounting policies are being adopted. In such cases, you cannot consolidate. But can they follow like that? Yes, but consolidation is not possible. So therefore, to facilitate consolidation, the subsidiary's financial statement should be redrafted to confirm with the accounting policies of the holding company or the parent enterprise. That is only for the purpose of facilitating consolidation, you are redrafting it. Your, your financial statements of subsidiary will still follow its own set of accounting policies, need not confirm with parent enterprise. But just to facilitate consolidation, on the date of drafting financial statements on consolidated basis, I will redraft the subsidy. Guys, it is reworking again. So generally, it is a concept of the, of the company to follow same set of accounting policies so that it will be easier for them to actually consolidate. Guys, whenever I redraft the financial statements of the subsidiary to confirm with the accounting policies of parent enterprise, the difference which arises in redrafting should be transferred to other equity. Clear? So whenever I redraft subsidiary's financial statements, the difference which arises I will pack it into other equity of the subsidiary. Now what about dividend from subsidiary? Any dividend income which is received from subsidiary, how do I account for this dividend income? Remember guys, dividend income should be recognized by any person. By any person, dividend, if I hold investments in another company and I, I have to recognize dividend income, then I recognize dividend income only when I have a right to receive the dividend. Only when right to receive dividend is established. Same concept even applies to holding subsidiary also. So the holding company is entitled to receive dividend from subsidiary. So the holding company will recognize dividend as income, uh, uh, dividend income from the subsidiary only when the right to receive dividend is established. When do you say that the right to receive dividend is established? I will say that the right to receive dividend is established when a valid resolution of pay for payment of dividend is passed in the AGM of the subsidiary. In the AGM of the subsidiary, if a valid resolution has been passed, then in such situations, you can say that the right to receive dividend has been established. Clear? Now, before I move further into this concept, I will have to bring out another concept for you for treatment of subsidy. What is the other concept? I'll tell you. In the books of holding company, in the books of holding or enterprise, we have investments in subsidiary, correct? This investment in subsidiary is held as an asset. This asset of investment can be valued on two bases. They can either be valued on cost or valued at fair value. Value at cost or they can be valued at fair value. If I measure the cost, then that means I'm applying with the standard in days 27. But if I'm valuing it at fair value, then I'm adopting in days 109 of investment. Either way is absolutely fine. It is 100% at the option of the holding company. Either of these two is fine. It is at the option of the holding company. But however you measure it, it is going to determine your, your, your recognition of dividend income. I'll tell you. As far as your 
recognition at fair value is concerned if the investment is measured at fair value then dividend income from subsidiary should be transferred dividend income from the subsidiary should be transferred when you value it at cost then i can have multiple treatments in this case your dividend income subsidiary dividend income subsidiary should be identifying to be subsidiary cost in such cases i will divide the in, uh, dividend income from subsidiary into two ways one is called as return on investment and other one is called as return of investment return of investment if it is compatible as return on investment I have to in such case, in case, case is return of investment, then I'll have to transfer it to profit to cost of investment. I have to do some cost of investment. If you understood nothing in this, I'll repeat again and I'll help you with the example. I am saying in the books of a parent enterprise, the investment in subsidiary can either be measured at cost or can be measured at fair value. If I am measuring it at, at cost, then I am adopting the standard India's 27 separate set of financial statements. But if I am measuring it at fair value, then it is common for all enterprises. I am adopting India's 109. If I adopt in days 109 and I receive any dividend income from subsidiary, straightforward I'll put it off to PL, no discussion anymore, any longer. But when I am invest when I am carrying investment at cost, applying in days 27, then the dividend income of subsidiary should be identified as return of investment or return on investment. If it is classified as return on investment, then I will again transfer it to PL. But if it is categorized as return of investment, then I'll have to transfer it to cost of investment. What is this concept? What is this return of investment? This concept of return of investment is called as pre-acquisition dividend. This is called as pre-acquisition dividend. In such cases, normally I would have passed the entry normally i would have passed the entry bank account debit to dividend income correct this dividend income should be transferred to pnl but if it is return on in a return of investment then instead of transferring it to dividend income i have to transfer it to cost of investment so to investment in subsidiary I'll have to credit either of them depending on the situation. Now, give me with an example on what I just said. I'll tell. You. Let's say for suppose the financial is starting on first April two thousand three. The dividend regarding this was paid on 30th of September. Okay. This is my dividend payment date. Let's say I purchased investment here. 30th June 2021. 
I purchased investment in subsidiary. In such case, understand, I am entitled to receive the dividend on 30th September because as on the book closure day, I am receiving the dividend. As on book closure day, I am the shareholder, I will receive dividend. But which year dividend is this? This is the dividend for the year 2022. Was it gold share on the date? No. Therefore, in this case, the cost of shares which you acquired, cost of subsidiary, should be as come dividend price. Come dividend price. It's called as dividend price. So whenever I receive the dividend, I will have to make sure that the investments go back to X dividend price. So what do I do? This cost of investment, I will reduce it less. Dividend income or dividend from subsidy. for year Finally, I will get X dividend price. X dividend. Clear? Only institution when you buy the shares of the subsidiary after the book closure date, after your balance sheet date, but before the date on which the dividend is paid. Only in such situation. I will identify that these shares are come dividend in price. They are come dividend in value. Therefore, in such situations only, I will have to make sure that the dividend received from subsidiary is treated as a return of investment and I'll have to reduce it from the cost of investment to make it an X dividend price. To make it an X dividend price. Clear? In such cases, I will make sure that it is reduced from the cost of investment. In all other situations, Dividend income should be straightforward credited to PN. In this case, let's say the dividend is received for the next year 2122. In the year 2122, I am holding shares. Therefore, I will still treat it again as return on investment and transfer it to PN. Only for once, I will treat it as return of investment where I will reduce it from the cost of investment. This is exactly what we have to discuss as far as dividend income is concerned. But remember, your ICI solved all the problems based on the approach that the investments are measured at fair value under India's 109. So dividend income will be transferred to PNL. This concept of return of investment and return on investment is not considered at all. It is not considered at all in any of the adjustments because we tend to believe that always the investments in subsidiary are measured at fair value. So this concept will emerge of return on investment and return of investment only if the investments are measured at cost. If you don't take that assumption that the investments are measured at cost, then you can forget about this logic of return of investment and return on investment. You can straightforward transfer it to PN. However, since the discussion is given, so I did continue with the discussion of what is return of investment and what is the treatment that we are supposed to do whenever you have a return of investment. Clear? Let's look at the PDF then. Return of investment and return on investment. Return of investment is when the investment in subsidiary is measured at cost. In such cases, reduce dividend receipt from the cost of investment only if the shares were purchased on come dividend basis. Return on investment when the investment in the subsidiary is measured at its fair value. In such cases, the dividend income should be credited to PNL by the parent enterprise. So no discussion regarding return of investment on return on investment. If it is measured at fair value, dividend from subsidiary transfer to PNL. 
when will you transfer it to pnl only when i have a right to receive the dividend when do you have a right to receive dividend when a valid resolution is passed in the agm only when a valid resolution is passed in the agm i will have to consider it as uh, a dividend income in the pnl so therefore this is a conclusion about the discussion or the adjustment which relates to dividend income in my subsidiary clear Yes, guys. Now we come into the concept of intercompany transactions. What do you mean by intercompany transaction? That means the holding company is having certain transactions with the subsidiary. So they might sell goods, they might sell an asset, whatever it is. That is a transaction which happened. A bill of the subsidiary is given to the holding company, which the holding company discounted in the bank. So there is a mutual transaction which occurred between the holding and subsidiary. Guys, remember. I will apply an adjustment for intercompany transactions between a holding and subsidiary only if they occur after the date of acquiring controlling interest. If there is a transaction between the parent and the subsidiary prior to acquiring the controlling interest, let's say controlling interest was acquired on 28th March 2021. All those transactions between these two enterprises before 28th March 2021 should be ignored. You cannot have an adjustment there. But if there is a transaction which occurred after 28th March, after the acquisition of controlling interest, then you need to apply certain adjustments. If there is an intercompany owing, owing means bills receivable of holding company, bills payable of subsidiary, creditor in holding company, debtor of subsidiary, loan to subsidiary in holding company, loan from holding in subsidiary company. These are mutual owings. When I combine these two balance sheets, the debtor and creditors, bills receivable and bills payable, loans and advances, they get knocked off from each other because they are being represented on both sides of the balance sheet. So they, do, they should generally get knocked off or cancelled. But when I am talking about intercompany transaction, I talk about something called as unrealized profit. What is this logic of unrealized profit? Let's see. Let's say, for example, the holding company H subsidiary S holding company sold goods to subsidiary.
in holding company the cost of these goods were 100 number of units sold let's say is 10 that means the total transaction is of 1000 rupees simple says that's why i took like that but the selling price sold goods at not 100 but at 120 subsidiary again sold the goods to external customers where in this case let's say the sales were done at 50 let's say the number of units sold in this case were 8 that means as far as the subsidiary is concerned there is an inventory which is still left out inventory is equal to 2 units at 120 rupees which is 250 he does not know the cost is 100 he, he just knows the what at, at what price he has acquired it from H so inventory should be measured at cost let's say NRV is higher so it is 240. When we combine, when we combine, then the inventory of holding and the inventory of subsidiary should be combined with each other. So whenever you prepare consolidated financial statements, upon consolidation, then this inventory value should be reduced by 4 rupees so that comes to the actual cost of inventory to the holding company so consolidation also I will record only inventory at cost so inventory should be measured at 200 and not 240 so I will reduce the inventory by 40 what is the other impact you need to understand that one single impact in the balance sheet is not sufficient. Two impacts should be given. What is the second impact? Since the units of 100 rupees were sold by holding company to the subsidiary at 120, 20 rupees per unit has already been included as profit in holding company. Therefore, upon consolidation, inventory is reduced by 40. At the same time, the PNL of holding company H should be used by 40. What was the actual total profit then? Actually, if you look at each unit sold at 120, 20 rupees profit on 10 units is 200. But how much did I adjust? I adjusted only for 40, but not the entire 200. Why is that so? Because 8 units were already sold out. I will only adjust for unrealized profit only to the extent of inventory held by subsidiary or inventory held by intercompanies. Beyond that, whatever inventory was already sold off, I will not call it as unrealized profit. It is realized profit. What is a realized profit? 20 rupees to holding company with respect to 8 units or 20 rupees per unit of 8 units is realized because the sale is completed to external customer. To subsidiary, 30 rupees is the profit because 120 minus 150. 30 rupees is already recognized as profit by S limit. So holding company recognized 20 rupees profit, subsidiary recognized 30 rupees profit, total profit is 150, or total profit is 50 on 8 items realized. But to the extent of those 2 items which are still lying in the inventory, I will consider it as unrealized profit. Therefore, it should be reduced from the cost of inventory. At the same time, also reduced from the person who made that profit. Here, H limited made the profit. So I'll reduce H limited's profit by 40. This is my intercompany transaction. These transactions which move from holding to subsidiary is called as a downstream transaction. Similar transaction ULTA, where a subsidiary sold goods to holding company, such cases I'll call it as upstream transaction. Be it upstream or downstream, inventory should be shown at cost. So inventory has to be reduced by the amount of unrealized profit. If it is a downstream transaction, holding made the profit. 
so the pnl of holding company is reduced if it is an upstream transaction where subsidiary sold goods to holding who made the profit subsidiary made the profit therefore subsidiary's pnl should reduce by 40 rupees look at what he says downstream and upstream transactions it is downstream if holding sells goods to subsidiary it is upstream when subsidiary sells goods to holding what is the adjustment i'll reduce the unrealized profit from the cost of inventory and i will reduce the reserve or the pnl of the enterprise which has earned that unrealized profit if it is a downstream transaction who made the profit holding if it is an upstream transaction who made the profit subsidiary so such enterprise which made such profit should be reduced clear how do i calculate unrealized profit on inventory closing inventory multiplied by gp margin okay but if it is a non current asset if it is a non current asset what do you mean by non current asset that means it is an asset law of fixed asset let's say a machine was sold then in such cases inventory situation will not arise so therefore whenever it is a fixed asset which is depreciable then unrealized profit should be profit on on sale minus depreciation on profit till date i'll tell you i'll help you with an example let's say for example again i have the same thing holding and subsidiary holding sold a machine to subsidiary the cost of the machinery i'll tell you but it was sold at 120 on 1st jan 2021 while the cost of the machinery only 100 what is the profit on sale my profit on sale is 20 let's say depreciation rate on this is at 10 percent then in such cases how do i identify unrealized profit in this case i'll reduce minus depreciation on profit up to 31st of march to the calculate what is your profit 20 what is the depreciation rate 10 percent 20 but when was the sale first of jan what is your balance sheet date 31st of march therefore how much should be calculated a profit only three months into three by 12 is so two divided by four it is nothing but 0 0.5 therefore what is profit 19.5 should be considered as unrealized profit on 31st March. Unrealized profit on 31st March 2021. If I should calculate what is the unrealized profit on 31st March 2022, further depreciate minus depreciation for 2120 how much 10% what is the amount 10% of 20 is basically 2 rupees therefore what is the unrealized profit on 31st march 2022 unrealized profit on 31st march 2022 is 17 point here so like this as years progress by your unrealized profit keep on reducing so what should i do i will reduce the machinery by the unrealized profit the same reduction should also be made in the profit of the company in the pnl of the company which sold the machine 
in this example who sold h sold so the p and l of h should be reduced at the same time the machinery also should be reduced in its value by 19.5 on 31st march 21 by 17.5 on 31st march 22 this is the concept of unrealized profit on a non current asset if there is a non current asset which is sold then this is how i adjust it that is what he said profit on sale reduced by depreciation on the profit till date clear if the transactions between group enterprise has occurred prior to the acquisition of controlling interest then the concept of unrealized profit does not arise it does not arise mutual owings mutual owings among group companies should be eliminated in addition to on addition of assets and liabilities in preparation of balance sheet this is what we have discussed if i have a bills receivable such bills receivable if it is held to maturity then i will eliminate but if it is discounted with bank is it still there with me no who owns the bill now the bill is owned by the bank how will i cancel let's say subsidiary gave the bill there for example let's say Let's say for example, there was a subsidiary and a holding, okay? The subsidiary had a bill payable of 100 rupees. The same 100 rupees was receivable with holding company. Holding company can do three functions with these bills. One, two, three. First one. I can hold till maturity. Hold till maturity. In such case, I will eliminate the both bills receivable and bills payable because it is still appearing in the balance sheet of holding company. So, in such cases, eliminate. But if it is discounted to bank, who owns it now? The bill is not, not owned by holding company anymore. This discounted bank. Basically, the bill has now become the property of the bank. I cannot cancel the bill anymore because the bills receivable is not there in holding company. It has been transferred to the bank. In such cases, no. If I endorse it to creditor, Even in such case, the bill is order with the whole company. Who is owner of the owner is the creditor. Therefore, there is no elimination even when I endorse the bill to the creditor. Clear? The same thing is being established here. Look at your PDF. Endorsed to creditor, no elimination on consolidation. Discounted with bank, not eliminated on consolidation. But if it is held to maturity, then you will eliminate it when you consolidate. Clear?